Presented by Botano, T-minus five days away from the launch of season number two here of Leafs Morning Take. It's Nick Alberga and Jay Rosa with you and Rosie. The preseason, it's already dragging out. I don't know if you feel the same way. Yeah, it seems like we're waiting forever, man. The season's starting a little late this year, it seems like, and I'm ready for it to go, man. Enough's enough. Let's rock and roll. Put the hammer down, but we got a little bit left to wait, but it's coming close, bud. We do. Uh, we announced some big news the other day as well. Uh, the introduction of Anthony Stewart and Carter Hutton to the team, as well as guest co-hosts. I think we need both of them to carry your shoes, bud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice, man. I mean, last year we got our feet wet figuring out what we're going to do. And this year we got a little bit more help and support. If I'm not here, one of those guys is going to jump in and both uh, very capable guys to do it with tons of experience, both in this world and the hockey world. So nice additions to the show for sure. You guys can look forward to that. That's exactly it. So they'll fill in uh, from time to time. Of course, Stewie um, with Sportsnet the last couple of years and Carter Hutton just starting in the industry, but gives the unique perspective from a former net minder. I love goalies, man. They're the best. I know it reminds me of noodles, you know, like the best seat in the house when you, I think Hutton's played a couple hundred games for sure, which is absolutely no slouch for a goaltender, but maybe 600 sitting on the bench. And I always like that perspective of that goalie because he's sitting there, he's hearing everything. He's part of everything and everyone he's around and just a nice, unique perspective from seasons, teams, players, the league in general. It's a, it's a nice addition, no doubt. So let me tell you something. Uh, I was in uh, New York for 24 hours, man. The quickest trip of my life filled with delays, cancel. Dude, I could not believe it. One hour flight on the way there. How many cancellations? There was like two cancellations, got on one flight. Then we did plane because there was a mechanical issue. But I fully support that. If there's any issue, any inkling with some sort of problem with the plane, get me off that plane. But yeah, I could I not believe that, baby. Russians yeah, no. Just fly it. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's one of those things where it's like, it's an hour flight. There, there shouldn't be that many disruptions. But I got to New York, and the point of the story was the fact that, did, as some of you know, I do some freelance work with the NHL, and I talked to some big rigs there. And I will tell you, there are some big plans, massive plans in place for All-Star Weekend. I really can't get into the gist of what's going on, but Steve Mayer, who we had on the show a couple months back, has agreed to come back on closer to uh, February when the All-Star Game will be uh, in Toronto. But I can tell you they're working on some big-time things. Actually, pretty cool. That's good to hear. It's good to hear. I mean, I don't think it's an easy job to keep that thing fresh and to keep that uh, All-Star weekend, you know, interesting and relevant. And it's kind of makes me chuckle because we I was kind of chirping it a little bit, you know, when you got the, the cowboy hat on and you come out like it's a little bit of a circus. I chirped off a little bit and then Steve Mayer comes on and he's the guy that put it all together. <laughs> And but he appreciated it. He's like, hey, I want to know what's good, what's bad. If you got any ideas, I'm all ears. He was a really solid stand up guy. Um, smart dude, no question running the show in that department for the NHL. And I imagine they've got uh, a lot of good minds together and they got lots planned for a weekend in Toronto. We all know it's kind of the hub of hockey and it's going to be a big show. We're going to be there as well. And we're looking forward to it. So it's good to hear they got lots in the works. Yeah. I wouldn't go into detail, but uh, that that's what he would say. And he said it many, many times. Uh, just wait till you see what we have planned for all-star weekend. So we hope we can break some stuff on this show and have Steve Mayer on uh, once again, down the road, as we get set for the all-star game in Toronto. Don't forget at the Leafs nation 401, where you can subscribe here on YouTube, also available wherever you find your podcast. If you're listening to us right now, just search Leafs Morning Take. Again, season number two launching on Monday, Monday to Friday, and we're going 45 minutes in length this year as opposed to 30 last year. So so can't wait for that. Speaking of can't wait, Easton Cowan. Uh, it, it just reminds me of like the next best prospect for the Maple Leafs, and I understand the media plays an impact in this, but like they're talking about this kid like he's the second coming. It's, it's very early on in training camp. He's looked good. It's a great story, but there's no chance he makes this team, right? No, not this year. Uh, and that's expected. And I think he expects that. But to me, I mean, it was just a couple months ago. Nobody, I mean, he wasn't part of the organization at all. We draft them first round, late first round pick. And now all of a sudden he's making noise and people are, are saying positive things. I mean, that's all you can ask at that level. This kid comes from the Ontario Hockey League. He's playing against boys. And then, you know, he gets chucked into her this year at camp and flourishes, stands out, opens people's eyes. That's as much as you can ask for a guy that just got drafted a few months ago to come in and play with essentially men at a higher level. I know it's exhibition. I know it's camp. 
but this isn't the Ontario Hockey League. He comes in and he stands out. And all that tells anyone that has anything to do with this team is that this kid is high quality. He is a high prospect. And there is nothing but potential for this guy. Uh, I think it needs to end there and people need to temper yeah. expectations because it wouldn't be the first time that this market has put a guy up on a pedestal and then tore him down as soon as he didn't become the second cr- coming. And that's not fair to that kid at all. So all you can say is hats off to you. You've done exactly what you've been asked to do and what people could expect of you. And it's a, it's a good start to a kid's career that I imagine is going to span a long time. To me, it's a win all around. So, like, first and foremost, he was outstanding. In fact, he stood out at the Traverse City Prospect Tournament. Now he's excelling in preseason games, which has awarded him more time. And the fact that he doesn't have to go back to junior just yet, he's practicing with sort of the big boys on the roster, which is always good. I know the Leafs took a bit of heat for taking him, maybe jumping early at 28th overall. But, uh, you know, very least, it, it solidifies that, hey, maybe they made the right pick. And, again, it's very early on. And the other thing for me is like, I'm always thinking about trades. As you know, hell, I have a shirt. Somebody makes a chest. Someone make a trade. I think down the road, it only helps to solidify something when it comes to the trade perspective from outside, you know, watchers. The fact that maybe you can use an Easton Cowan to go out there and get a top four defenseman. Like, I'm not saying for sure they're going to trade this guy, but I, I do think it's a win all around if he plays well. So this guy just got drafted, stands out well, and you're talking about dishing him, hey? Well, okay, so so people, you got to look at that. You got to look at it from all perspectives. Who do the Leafs have? Okay, so everybody wants that top four defenseman. If they're not going to trade Nylander, who who are they giving up to get that? Like, are, are teams just donating these guys to them? or Not at all. And I see where you're coming from, man. And it's, uh, it is a piece. It's just an extra piece that we didn't have a few months ago when we were in the same boat. Now we've got a piece, you know, do you wrap something like that up? I mean, what's Nick Robertson going to be? How, who, who's yeah. rebuilding? Who wants these prospects? Um, you know, teams that have been high and mighty and are kind of backing off now and some of their guys are getting older and moving on. And now all of a sudden it's like, let's get something in the woodworks here so that in two years we're rocking and rolling again. I mean, some of these deals that can be put together, yes. And those top four defensemen are not come around all the time. Maybe a sprinkle piece would be one of those prospects, but absolutely. It's another piece in the arsenal that, uh, that can be used to get what we need right now. Now's the time for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I'm just teasing you. I don't think that it's a problem to get rid of a a prospect like that. Cause now's the time you're not going to, you can't split yourself too thin and say, oh, well, we're going to kind of try to win this year. Yeah. But also we want Easton Cowan because in two years he could be good. It's like, are you doing it or not? And I'm not saying sell everything in the kitchen sink, but I mean, you got to move pieces to get pieces. And and he could be in the conversation for sure, especially now that he's kind of made some noise. Because as you know, a couple of weeks back, I did a piece with Stephen Ellis of Daily Faceoff breaking down the prospect tournament. And we talked about and he talked at length how the Leafs prospect capital is not really there anymore. And understandably so, they're always a contender, not really making first round picks but now suddenly they could have a prospect that could be enticing for teams to part with players and I think last time I checked you need assets to get assets and certainly I think picks will be in play but a guy like Easton Cow and I I would hate to see the guy go but I think at the very least it is a win all around for the Maple Leafs for this kid to show what he's worth early on in his career again a couple of months removed as Rosie mentioned from being drafted so uh so far so good for Easton Cow and he'll be in the lineup Rosie for this uh First preseason game for John Tavares, the Kraft Hockeyville game, West Lauren, Ontario, Elgin County, near St. Thomas. It wasn't supposed to be awarded to St. Thomas because I was reading that for capacity reasons, the game's actually going to take place in St. Thomas at the Joe Thornton Community Center. Did you ever play one of these games where it was like a small community get to see NHL players play? Uh, we did a lot of that with the Leafs. Um, yeah. <sighs> I mean, we would always play the Flyers in London, which is kind of different than a small community thing. But we'd hold a lot of practices in um, in smaller towns and communities. If we're doing a team building thing up in Trenton, Ontario, we'll hold a practice there. Um, You know, New York City, we would do something at uh, I think it was Walman Rink in Central Park. We had a practice there um, cruising through communities. And it's fun because it's more intimate. Right. All the the people that are there don't get to see the team all the time. And it's special for them. And you can feel that and see that, especially on the kids' face. So that's fun for the players to go out there. And it's not the same old people that are always hanging out at the practice rink. It's it's new faces. And like I said, people that don't get this opportunity all the time. So it's nice to see all the, the players excited for that and kind of spend a little bit more time with the fans and kids and 
taking pictures, whatnot. It, it's fun because that is the grassroots of hockey. That is what makes the team what it is, is those people out there that, that support quietly from afar and you actually get to interact with them is, is definitely cool with that organization. Come to think of it, you know, I went to Fanshawe College in London. I may have been at one of those games and I think you played in them at the John Labatt Center at the time. I think it's Budweiser Gardens in London where it was the annual game. It was Philadelphia and Toronto. No way. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, there's usually a split game, one going on, I think, in T.O. and then one going on yeah. in Lundo. And yeah, the barn was packed, obviously. And, uh, you know, it's this time of year that the Leafs are going through right now. It's uh, preseason games. It's roster shuffles. It's cutting down and getting ready for the season. And I remember that very well. It was uh, it was a good atmosphere that London's got it going on there for a, for a junior team. Dude, people wonder why players want to go to London to play for the Hunters. I think it's more the experience. You're an absolute rock star. Like, actually, when I was in school there, one of my buddies from high school who was high up in the World Junior Program, he was a goalie, but killed his hip and pretty much his career was finished. Former uh, second rounder, I believe, of Colorado. Played for the Knights, dude. The guy was an absolute rock star. Like, it felt like it was, like, comparable to being a Toronto Maple Leaf in Toronto, what it is to being a London Knight in London. Like, you're, you're treated like royalty. Easton Cowan, of course, plays there. Um, it'll be fun to document sort of his season. But that barn is packed all the time, and it's 11,000 screaming junior fans, man. It's crazy. Yeah, well, I know that when Kadri, Nazem yeah. Kadri, got uh, drafted and he was on my team. I used to bump years. into him, too, in town. <laughs> oh, God, would he talk about Lundo, go Lundo, Lundo. Yeah, and this kid's like an 18, 19-year-old kid on the Toronto Maple Leafs. And every day off, he'd go back to Lundo to, like, party and to hang Dude, out. Dude, I have the funniest group. I have the funniest story about Nazem Kadri. So, like, as everybody knows, or most of you now listening to this podcast for, like, the last year, like, I went to school there. I went to Fanshawe College. But my good buddy went to Western, like one of my best friends. And one time we ordered pizza and I kid you not, Nazem Kadri's uncle delivered the pizza and we knew because it said Kadri. All he had was Kadri on his name tag, man. How insane is that? It was like not so London. Yeah, just that, Kadri on it. That name uh, held weight in London during those oh. times, didn't it? Dude, like I was there in the Kadri era. Th those guys were rock stars. Michael Delzato, JT was on that team for a cup of tea after the deadline being dealt from Oshawa. Yeah. Like they were stacked with really, really good players. And speaking of John Tavares, uh, I had a question for you. So John Tavares, the captain, is going to make his preseason debut. I think it's perfectly put since he used to play for the London Knights and it's close to that area. But we're going to get our first look here. At Nyes, JT, and Lafferty as a trio. And I know a lot's been made of the lines early on here in training camp. How do you see that working out? I just, I have my reservations. And again, remains to be seen how this works out in the long run. But Sam Lafferty, to me, is like a guy who's scratching and clawing to be even on this roster, on the opening night roster, never mind on the second line. Maybe I view him a bit differently than some people. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's Sheldon Keefe at work trying. I mean, he gets these ideas in his head and likes to try them, right? Which <laughs> is fine, I suppose, especially this time of year. Um, it does look odd having him in the top six of this superpower offense forward top six as it is when, like you say, he doesn't really seem like the guy to stand out to get that position. But obviously they're trying to, you know, spread out the depth a little bit, spread out the talent, not have it so top six heavy. And they're trying to find some for whatever reason. I mean, I don't know these guys as intimately as Sheldon Keefe. So yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say that he he has something that he feels that he wants to try. And having those three players together, I mean, you got defensive responsibility. Um, obviously, Nisey can skate. I want both Lafferty and Nisey to be in the corners banging, using their, their bodies to, you know, affect the offensive zone especially get the pucks back i love the way nisey plays that power forward role and jt speaks for himself so it's a combination that keep obviously thinks has potential to click this isn't stuff that you could ever force or that you could ever you know just make happen but by trying it it shows me that he thinks there's potential there and he's going to try it in the preseason why not and just see if any of that um, jam or gel starts to happen within those three. And I mean, like I said, now's the time to try that. It's not a huge deal to me, whether it lasts or not. I mean, in three weeks, we might look back and say, oh yeah, I remember that. And it's an absolute throwaway and nothing, but there's reason for them to think there's a uh, potential there. It's become abundantly clear that they view like Nyes and Tavares as a combo. And I think they're, they're, they're searching out that chemistry because they live together, right? Like not to compare it to like Crosby and Lemieux all those years ago living together, but I think you start off on the right track in terms of chemistry when you know each other that well over the first couple months of a young player's career. But I think they're missing something by 
not putting knives with Matthews. Like that's the ideal spot for my, for, for me, at least. And I know you want to maybe put Domi in that. Like there's a lot of different looks we're going to get throughout this season. I get where you're coming from, but in the grand scheme of things, do I see Nylander sticking as a center? I know people are trying to number the lines. Ultimately, no, I think he finds himself back into that top six. And I don't think Sam Lafferty is going to be that guy. Like I think he's better served to be a bottom six guy. And I think if I were numbering lines, this is probably the third line anyways. Yeah. I kind of know what you're saying. Um, that does turn me on, man. The Nyes and, and Matthews. I mean, oh. Nyes, can go down. He can buzz down low, get that puck back, protect that puck, get possession of it. Find Matthews in his soft spots where he's great for for getting and getting that shot off, and then Nizy in front of that net. I mean, rebounds and things of that nature. I mean, he seems to be great at getting a hold of those and using his body in front of the net, garnering those loose pucks. and And I can just see, just click, click, click with those two and scoring goals a million different ways because they're utilizing both of the, both of their strengths. Um, I, I do not think we're going to go through the season without seeing that. I yeah. mean, we saw it in the playoffs. And I mean, remember that? Was it first, second game for Nisey? It was just like he had like five quality chances. It took him a little while to bury his first one. But it's just like, oh, my God, this guy is buzzing. He's everywhere. And he's utilizing all the people around him. It was beautiful. So I'm sure we'll see that down the road. But again, Sheldon likes to dick around and, and see what it is. And and if he wants to, if he's got something that's itching at the back of his neck that says, I'd love to see what this looks like, then go chuck it and see it. And right now, don't do it two weeks before the playoffs. Do it right now. See how you feel. See if it works. And why the hell not? I got no, I got no, um, you know, reservations about what he's doing this time of the season. Before people get on me in the chat, I understand it's Tyler Bertuzzi with Austin Matthews. Domi will likely get it look as well, but they do have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to wingers. And ideally, I'd love to see Nyes there. At some point in time, we will see Nyes there. And as you referenced uh, last year in the postseason, we got a sneak peek at what Nyes and Matthews can put together. And it is, quite frankly, really, really scary. But sort of those are the the, the big topics, the big stories uh, in Leafs Nation, some Housekeeping, I mean, TJ Brody just working his way back. Of course, his father and our condolences to the fam family passing away a couple weeks back, so they're giving him some time. Cali Yarncroke has yet to play a game as well. They're calling it minor, but the longer he doesn't play, I don't think it's as minor as they're leading on, but teams don't tell you what's really going on. You've been on the other side of things. They keep things hush-hush, especially in Toronto. So those are the couple things that we're looking at, especially Yarncroke, where he fits into this lineup, because now – you have a player like uh, Easton Cowan or Nick Robertson. I think you get a, a bit more ice to show what you have, right? And that would be the only way that that happens, in my opinion, is injuries and, and unforeseen yeah. events where there's a hot, there's a spot in the lineup. I mean, before you know mid September, everyone's clicking and clacking the lineup and the roster and saying, "Well, here, this is what it is." But things happen, and and that's why these guys got to perform in camp, even though it seems like a lost cause where they don't have you know, a spot for them and people don't think they're going to be on the roster, but a guy goes down and all of a sudden, Oh, smokes, who are we going to fill that with? Yeah. And, you know, a guy waiting in the wings, who's been performing all camp and all preseason is a guy that uh, they will take that spot for sure. One of those boys would be slated for that. No doubt whether they stay all year or not, it's a different story, but you just got to get your chances and be ready. Obviously. One Options thing I like about good. this, yeah. this preseason is how nice is flown under the radar, man. We're talking about so many different guys, prospects to new players, Bertuzzi, Domi come in here, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's talking about that. Nice. has really flown under the radar. And I love that because a guy like him with all of his potential, he's kind of already got the, the pizzazz of last year when he came in, he was the most talked about thing at the end of the season there. And now all of a sudden he's poised to make his debut essentially. And no one's really talking about it. I like that in this market for a guy like him to just be able to go and say, Oh yeah, remember me come the, come the beginning of the season, first few weeks. I think he's going to be the one that shines. Two, two time guests, the least morning take is Matthew Nyes. The Botano wrap up is presented by Botano.ca. The game starts now 19 plus please play responsibly. Uh, today we're going to try to handicap the Atlantic division. Um, I do think the top end, has fallen a bit with the likes of Tampa losing depth. The Florida Panthers are banged up. The Boston Bruins are not the same team. I think Toronto, as we mentioned in previous podcasts, have a very, very, very legitimate shot of winning this division, maybe winning the President's Trophy this season. Um, and I think you look at some of the up-and-coming teams. Like People feel strongly about Buffalo and Ottawa, and maybe Detroit takes that step. And Montreal is always a sleeper because they play most teams tough. They always play the Leafs tough, and I expect nothing different on opening night. 
Yeah, for sure. It's uh, it's a little bit feels like a changing of the guard. We've had the same thing for for quite a while with Tampa essentially being, you know, the king of the hill there in that division, and they seem to be taking a step back. If you look at the players that they've lost over the last couple of years, it's a it's a long list, and you're seeing turmoil between Stamkos and the organization. Uh, they're aging out a little bit. They've had their day in the sun, no question. They're going to take a step back. Boston. <laughs> Again, an anomaly of what the heck's going on with them to yeah. to win how many sixty? What the, how many games did they win, man? A it's lot. ridiculous. Yeah. And just floundered. And now they're kind of reeling. I think they got to figure out who they are and what's going on with their organization. And it just leaves the top open for grabs, basically. And I think you know you go to Botano and look at what some of the futures are looking like if they've got that posted. Who can come and steal this uh, this yeah. division? I think the Leafs are going to be the obvious choice and uh, at, at that and if you want to go top half type of thing i mean lots of talking about buffalo like you said i don't know if stevie eiserman's as uh, brilliant as people are uh thinking that he was at one point but time will tell uh they're trying to scratch and claw but i like uh, my point is a lot of people are trying to trying to stake their claim in this division and it's an interesting to watch interesting division to watch right now Identity crisis, I think, is the best theme and trend of this division right now um, amongst the teams. And I think you're banging on in the Leafs. I've been saying this for a while. If they can have a good October as opposed to seasons past, I, I think they're going to win this division finally. Like, I think it's there for the taking. Of course, what one division title in the last 20 to 25 years it was the North Division. And we all know what happened in the Stanley Cup playoffs last that year. So ultimately, does the regular season mean much? Just make the postseason. I think we've learned that a lot. Vegas last year, the Florida Panthers just get in. Anything can happen, but certainly it's going to be a lengthy journey to the end for us, hopefully for the Maple Leafs in next spring. And I'm excited to get cooking here in October, Rosie. I know it's funny that we keep like saying the October they flounder. I look at that dressing room and I mean, so many new bodies, so many new pieces to that puzzle. And it just seems like just because they wear the same logo on the front of their shirt, they're going to they're gonna flounder in October. But, yeah. I mean, they have done it in the past traditionally. Why that is, I have no idea. But I don't think there's any reason to assume it's going to happen again this year because they definitely have a different look to their team and a bunch of different bodies and a different identity. So let's hope they can get on a good start here and uh, not follow the past pattern of shitting the bed in October. Well, I don't think we shut the bed last year when we kicked off this show. And again, we're launching October 2nd. So that's Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern time right here on the Leafs Nation YouTube page available wherever you find your podcast on demand at the Leafs Nation 401. If you're not subscribed, I don't know what you're doing at the Leafs Nation 401. We'll talk uh, soon, Rosie. So we get set for another preseason game here for the Maple Leafs and to get closer and closer to making some decisions. Yeah, enough teeing this thing up. Let's go, man. I'm ready. Can't wait. That is Jay Rosehill. I'm Nick Alberga. Thanks so much for listening and watching. We'll talk soon.